Okay, I guess it's now time. Um, so, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you all so very much for your flexibility to join us today. Um, we sincerely hope that you and your families are in the best of health uh, at this time and stand in solidarity with everyone who has been uh, affected by the global pandemic. Um, our conversation today could not be more timely or relevant, and we're very honored to be joined uh, by a very distinguished panel. Um, we will have four segments uh, of the conversation, starting off uh, with an opening uh, and introduction to global digital cooperation by His Excellency Under Secretary General Fabrizio Hochschild. Um, continued by a uh, high level panel, um, followed by then a uh, segment and discussion with the distinguished experts um, before we move on to the closing segment. Um, so without further ado, uh, allow me to turn over to uh, His Excellency Under Secretary General Fabrizio Hochschild, um, with, who is Special Advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations on Digital Cooperation uh, for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, and it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. And I'd also like to uh, reiterate uh, the hope expressed by, by Hannah that everybody is uh, in good health and their loved ones uh, also. Welcome to this IGF main session on global digital cooperation. It's a pleasure to be among you. Many of you have uh, not only read, but provided input to the Secretary General's roadmap on digital uh, cooperation, which we launched in June. The reactions that we got after the issuing of the roadmap have broadly been very favorable and indicate to me that what we, through our multi-stakeholder process, brought together in the roadmap really represents a convergence of views of what needs to be done across stakeholder groups and regions. And we, I was further encouraged in this thinking by the fact that in September, member states formally recognized the need for global digital cooperation with a paragraph in the high level declaration on the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. That paragraph explicitly calls for the UN to be a platform for all actors together to steer global technology, digital technologies better towards serving the SDGs. The challenge before us now does not appear so much to be what to do. We know we need to overcome digital divides and we know we need to find ways to make online access safer, more useful and more secure while respecting human rights. What is not so clear is not so much the what as the how. And while many efforts point to the how, there are already efforts undergo are ongoing that are, that are very valuable, but they're not to scale and they're not always very well coordinated. And one example of that is the multiple efforts that are underway to include, to, to, to make the access to the internet more inclusive, especially of women and girls, and despite those many outstanding efforts, the statistics indicate that we're going in the reverse direction, that in fact, in terms of connectivity, the gender gap is growing rather than declining uh, on the internet. What we do know on the how is that whatever we do needs to be done through a multi-stakeholder effort. And although there may be different strongly held views a multi-stakeholder approach is essential. And the IGF in that sense is a tremendous platform. Indeed, we've seen this week as the sessions so far have been timely and insightful. And we're very fortunate to have all of you here now for this session, a truly multi-stakeholder representation. This session takes place as we consider how best to implement the Secretary General's roadmap recommendations pertaining to the global digital cooperation architecture. In addition to the IGF sessions that have covered specific themes like cybersecurity and digital connectivity, here we will discuss how to strengthen the IGF itself, advancing towards an IGF plus. Many of you provided inputs that are reflected in the excellent options paper prepared by the governments of Germany and the UAE. 
A number of you also participated in the IGF MAG Working Group on Strategy and Strengthening, which provided a very useful response paper with further analysis and suggestions. In this session, we will consider several key policy areas that have emerged pertaining to global digital cooperation, namely inclusion and broader participation, accelerated cooperation, outcomes, high-level engagement, and communications and financing. Each of these will be essential in ensuring a more impactful IGF or IGF plus and a more robust digital cooperation system. We are very fortunate to have several distinguished high-level speakers here with us. And I would like to start with the topic of accelerated cooperation with a question for His Excellency, Mr. Omar Sultan Olama, the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Government and Remote Work of the UAE. Excellencies, how do you think we can strengthen the cooperation among stakeholders, organization, processes, and forums? Thank you, Fabrizio. And it's an absolute pleasure and honor being with all of you here today. Um, it is a privilege that we are able to continuously meet together through these digital means and uh, aspire change across different geographies. Um, it's a very important question that you pose, Fabrizio, and I, I would like to be pragmatic and also try to answer it in the best way possible. I think in a world where we want to see accelerated change, where we are constantly distracted by notifications, why, where we are gratified by specific actions and specific pop-ups that come to us on these digital platforms, we need to ensure that the strategies and the roadmaps that we put are appealing to that kind of audience. We tend to like to go through discussions or put very ambitious goals that seem too far off. And unfortunately, as um, impact and as momentum uh, slows down, people get less motivated, uh, whether it's countries, companies, or even individuals to continue the efforts. It would be important for us to break down grand visions and also big goals into smaller chunks and actually create incentives for, for people to go through every single step and milestone the same way that they are incentivized, for example, to continuously use social media or continuously use specific digital platforms. The second is it is also very important and imperative that we ensure that the goals are goals that are multi-generational. Um, what tends to happen is sometimes we talk to one generation over the other. But what we can take from climate change, for example, and the action that was derived and created because of climate change is that because it's a multi-generational issue and the young people are as involved as the older generations, we are seeing today a explosion of action across the world and activism trying to solve this important issue. So uh, I do hope that we're able to uh, put things in this perspective. And I also do hope that we're able to leverage both technology and the architecture of how technology today is being built to put the right roadmap for us moving forward. Excellency, thank you so much. And I think the points you emphasize, the two points about having achievable uh, goals uh, and not being over, over ambitious and thus setting ourselves up for failure. And secondly, ensuring that we have a, a generational uh, approach that doesn't exclude anyone are two very important points that we, we, we will all try and bear better in mind. Uh, I'd now like to turn to His Excellency David Senge, the um, CIO and Minister of Basic Education of Sierra Leone, uh, on the topic of inclusion and broader uh, participation. Um, Minister, you, you're acutely aware of the digital divide. Uh, and we know that while uh, most of the developed world enjoys connectivity rates of 80 to 95 percent, in the least developed countries, uh, connectivity is, for the most part, under 20 percent. How can we have the most impact in improving representation of least developed countries in global digital cooperation? 
Thank you, Fabrizio and Excellency and other panels, other, other members, distinguished members on the call. I think this, there are two ways to address this. One, I'll address it from what we're doing in Sierra Leone. And the second one is um, in an opportunity that actually exists um, and how we can take advantage of. You rightly mentioned that in a place like Sierra Leone, connectivity, access to internet um, or internet use is around 20% or on the 20% in many places. But mobile connectivity is above 80%. And the opportunity here is many of these communities are going from 0G to 4G directly. So all our mobile tech companies who are building new towers are not building 1G, 2G, 3G sites. They are going directly from a space that had no tower to 4G. So you have communities, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are going from never having been connected to having the opportunity and capacity to use data, um, high-speed internet. So we, we, we saw this and we knew this will happen, which is why to address uh, this inclusion and opportunity, because inclusion is also bringing people who are excluded by an opportunity for everybody else. And um, we have an approach through our national innovation and digital strategy called Mobile First and mobile first and hybrid systems, hybrid technology systems. If we take a mobile first approach, it means how do we build solutions, applications, solve problems that everybody can have access to a phone and now many more, there's gonna be cheaper smartphones and it becomes a question of not just connectivity, um, but how do we make devices available? How do we have $50 devices and that not every device has to be $500? How do we go from a $500 device that does it's our computer to a $50 device that can allow people to buy goods, to know, to access health facilities, to be able to check up on their education learning. And when we have mobile first approaches, it means then that we're able to include people now, not just who are able to use data, but who can also use USSD and SMS. Then we'll really take advantage of the 87% of the people who are connected. And one of the things we did in Sierra Leone we do is by building apps that work online, offline, on web, on mobile, not just apps, but also SMS and USSD. So a lot of the solutions we've been building at the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation work with um, everybody uses USSD and USSD is no cost. Um, and to go from not just low cost, but low cost use of government services. And within the Digital Public Goods System Alliance, as, as well as Sierra Leone being a, a, one of the, the, the founding members, um, one of our solutions, our government to person solutions just got added um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Digital Public Goods Registry, which is for how we do batch payments uh, from, from governments like workers, risk workers um, in a really safe and secure way via mobile money. And these hybrid solutions and mobile um, technology, which might seem like it's already excluding, actually have a huge opportunity to include the most amounts of people to be able to get services. Because ultimately what we need is access to services. And that comes about when we think about connectivity and access in an expansive way. Thank you. Th thank you very much. And I, I think sharing with us those innovative approaches that you're adopting was, was very valuable. And I think there's, there's a lot of learning we can do from such examples. Uh, I'd like now um, to turn to, to Lisa Four the Director General of the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association, or EDNA. And I'd uh, like to discuss uh, th this issue further of accelerated cooperation. Lisa, in your view, what is a framework or model that serves as a best practice for multi-stakeholder uh, cross-country cooperation? Well, I, I think there are many ways we can build a, a framework around uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation, but I think there is an important point in, in first and foremost uh, to find a way to bring discussions and implementable solution into actually uh, uh, to, 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 to actions. And I think uh, here it's important that we bring in all the different stakeholder groups. 
uh, I think IGF right now is already leading the way in bringing all the players around the table. So that's a, a very good framework. And at this core, you have the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and the beaut beauty of this is actually the bottom up, it's the all inclusive uh, model. Uh, but the next step in, if we are to bridge uh, a gap and make sure all stakeholder groups are present and not only present, uh, we need them also to be engaged and, and we need to uh, be sure that every voice is, is heard here. Sometimes we have uh, big companies that might speak louder than others, but it's important that we engage and have uh, every voice heard in, in these discussions. And I think there is a very important uh, engagement uh, from institutions here too, because we see already increasing participation from uh, parliamentarians. But I think we need to see even more uh, uh, involvement from parliaments around the world. Um, I think it's important they go back to their countries with the IGF discussions to bring them alive in their organizations. And also what I think it's important is the national or regional uh, internet governance fora that are uh, all around the world. These are uh, one, uh, um, tools to bring these discussions uh, around the world, but also to make them implementable. Uh, and I also, as, as Edno, find that it's important also to have a strong European voice, of course, that brings European values uh, in the worldwide discussions. Uh, and I think that's important we do that through the EU institutions, but also through the uh, stakeholders. So uh, what is the implemented solutions? To what end uh, can we implement those solutions? Edna represents the, the telcos of, of Europe. And uh, while thinking about this question, I ask myself, why do we as Edna come to IGF uh, year after year? And why does Edna and the members prioritize uh, being here? And we come exactly for, for this. We come for an informed discussion and an informed exchange of views from all the people and all the groups that actually matters in, in this. And we think uh, that IGF has served uh, very successfully as a laboratory of an exchange, of a discussion, of a dissemination of best practices of technical expertise of capacity building initiatives among these stakeholder groups. So I think actually the IGF is a good institution and this is where the dialogue is happening. This is where implementable solutions come as a result of who's here, who's in the room, who's at the table, or as it is the case this year on a virtual conference. Thank you, Lisa, thank you very much. And I think, you know, your point on ensuring that inclusion is not just tokenistic, but is, is making voices heard that otherwise uh, are not heard and then taking those, given, giving weight uh, to, to what is said, that's really uh, important. Um, I'd now uh, like to, to continue a bit with the same topic and turn to Joseph Hall, who is a senior vice president for Strong Internet at the Internet Society, which has long been a strong supporter of the IGF uh, and actively engaged in follow-up to the high-level pa panel on roadmap. Joseph, how, how do you think the IGF can be better connected with other forums and processes which consider related matters? Thank you, and what an honor to be on this panel. Um, in order to bridge the gap between discussions and implementable solutions, I think it's important, I think at the Internet Society, we would emphasize that we need to share a common understanding of what the Internet is. Um, and this goes without saying, but the Internet is a pretty complex system from we, at least half of the planet benefits from. Um, however, like any ecosystem, we must understand what makes it such a platform for communication, creation, innovation. 
but we also have to consciously preserve its essential elements in any proposals that seek to change core technical or regulatory aspects of how it functions. I was thinking about this earlier, and I, um, a, a quick analogy to this is the quote-unquote scientific forestry employed in Germany in the 19th century, where complex forests were replaced with monocultural linear tree farms that were more easily tended to from a centralized way with with limited knowledge and you know the first yields of this mathematical timber so to speak were very very high but within about a century those same trees were very small and weak uh, reflecting sort of the interdependencies that exist in creating a truly magnificent sustainable ecosystem and and we think about that although only decades old depending on how you count the internet is like an old growth forest in its depth, in its variety, in its ability to survive attacks and disasters and continually reinvent itself. It is uh, a network of networks uh, whose value is the interrelationships between different devices, applications, and uses linked by a common set of protocols. Uh, the management is, is not centralized. Instead, it is the intelligence and autonomy are, are, are at, concentrated at the edges in the hands of those running these local networks. And so the internet is a place that everyone can enter, multiplying its connections and increasing their value for all. And so it's not just the technology or its services and use that define the internet. It's how we network, which we at the Internet Society call the internet way of networking that also matters. So we have to understand what the internet, internet is and honor that sort of DNA when we decide to make changes to it. I think that's a really key uh, core thread to what we're doing here. No, thank you uh, so much, uh, Joseph. And I, I think this notion of maintaining the, the decentralized character of the internet, the variety of the internet, the diversity of the internet, and anything that's done is a key point. A little known and totally irrelevant fact, but you, you provoked me to share it, is that I am actually a forester by training, and I spent part of my cool. training in Germany. And um, to be fair to German, um, and your analogy is very good, but to be fair to German forestry of today, they've long left behind a, a passion for monocultures and, and now uh, do plant forests that, that are not linear and are, are multi, multi uh, mixed species. But I like the analogy and I'll use it. Uh, and um, I think also, you know, like foresters, thinking what not just whatever economic gains or, or, or social impact or political impact we're gonna to have today. But you know, foresters think 50, 80, 120 years from now. And I think there's a legacy issue uh, around the internet that we also deserves uh, greater um, attention. But, but I mean, I, I, you know, I, you've provoked me now, but I'll shut up. Now I, I'd like to talk to, uh, I'd like to move to our next speaker, uh, Olga Cavalli who is the academic director at the South School on Internet Governance. Olga, I would like to go back to the topic of inclusion and broader participation. In what ways could we improve meaningful participation of, academ of academia in global digital cooperation, especially to the extent possible academia from developing countries? Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. And I want to congratulate the MAG and all the IGF staff for organizing this great IGF. I know how difficult it is to move from a face-to-face -face meeting, such a large meeting like IGF, to a virtual meeting, but I think it's going very well. I, I'm happy that it's spread all over the time so I can, I can participate in more workshops and main sessions as before. So my, my, I commend you for that. Uh, how can we, um, how can we make, um, how can we, we, we learned in the IGF how to, that we needed in Latin America, a stronger leadership that we, we realized that the leadership participating in IGF was low, was not informed. So what we started with the school of internet governance is uh, creating a space, especially with a multidisciplinary perspective. So those who were in, trained in law could learn from technology. Those trained in technology like myself could learn about regulations and human rights and privacy and security and other things. 
there is still a gap in between universities and all what we are doing in the IGF and uh, it's, it's up to us to bridge that, that gap. I, many of us, I'm a teacher at the University of Buenos Aires. And let me tell you, I am the only one, and it's just a very big university. It's the largest in speaking uh, uh, language in South America. I'm the only one following the IGF. And I talk about this with all my colleagues and I talk about this with my, my students and many of them have got engaged after I have I have uh, get in touch with them and give them the information and the relevance of the IGF. But I think we still have a gap, especially in developing countries. So we, we, we could do things like uh, partnering with universities to uh, promote and to organize hubs, uh, more, more active hubs. I, I know that the hubs are there, but we should have more active engagement with uh, developing universities from developing economies. As I said before, we believe that a stronger leadership in developing economies is relevant for, for achieving the goals that we, that we need for development and that the technology will bring. So I think we still have to work to, uh, to make that gap smaller. Thank you for, for inviting me. Well, thank you, Olga. And yes, there is, I mean, we have to recognize that gap and, and be aware of it and not delude ourselves. And thank you for your efforts in, in trying to reduce it. Um, we're also joined by Miranda Sissons, Director for Human Rights at Facebook. Miranda, from your perspective, what do you see as one of the greatest current challenges in digital cooperation? And what role do you see for the IGF in, in, in better addressing it? Thank you very much indeed. Salamu alaikum, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm also inspired by the different kinds of things that the other stakeholders have said. I'd like to applaud the openness of the Secretary General's process on digital cooperation and say that actually in the roadmap um, roundtables that we participated in, it was itself a great example of the practical benefits of a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and that multi-stakeholder approach is essential to what we need to do to drive global digital cooperation moving forward. And let me echo the other speakers. We do see the IGF as an extremely valuable forum because it's uniquely democratic and it has a vital role in helping uh, drive the vitality and connectedness of this crucial policy conversation, which is how we work to ensure this messy network of networks, the internet remains open, inclusive, secure and responsive to the needs of our time. But from my perspective um, and you know, that of, of, of uh, the human rights team at the company I work for, in terms of a challenge to global digital cooperation, one of the fundamental challenges is that the internet no longer has novelty value to many of us. And many of us are taking its economic, developmental and human rights benefits for granted, but we shouldn't. The internet's development isn't linear and neither is the governance development. It is not going to continue to act towards open exchange of information, innovation and expression unless we work hard to make it so. And that's particularly important this year. It's particularly important for this IGF because the realities of fragmentation are increasing rapidly. And they're caused by the efforts of some governments to segregate their internet, deploy arbitrary surveillance, weaken encrypted chat platforms, or enforce coercive data localization or sovereignty regimes. There are also many other centrifugal forces in play. But these changes are accelerating right now and they do present a real threat to the open internet. So the Secretary General's roadmap is a good start because it recognizes that human rights exist online as they do offline. And in your connect, protect and respect framework, we'd, I'd call attention to that whatever we do right now, we do have to give very strong attention to the idea that globally defined human rights have to be protected and respected in full. Because that rights regime is our strongest and most developed framework for promoting and protecting the best of our digital world 
and mitigating the worst of it. And to this audience, I want to remind you of Article 19 of the ICCPR, Freedom of Expression, Article 2, Non-Discrimination, Article 17, Privacy from Arbitrary Government Interference. So I spend, and many of the teams I work with, many of the entities I work with, spend many hours in practical work daily to defend those rights. And we hope that the increased due diligence and transparency that we are doing will be a rich vein of insight and accountability for all. But do we, we do want to say, we think that the meaningful global cooperation this year and in the years beyond depends on a bottom-up, transparent, multi-stakeholder process. And we see the soon to be appointed UN Tech Envoy as potentially playing a really important role in making that process a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Miranda. And I, I think you were, it was very helpful to remind us that we should not take this uh, uh, great creation for granted, but work to conserve it. And I, you know, it reminds me of something my, my former boss, Louise Arbour, um, who was a Supreme Court Justice in Canada, head of um, the International Crisis Group, High Commissioner for, for Human Rights, like to emphasize that the, the, the opposite of freedom is not the rule of law. The opposite of freedom is uh, tyranny. And in the absence of the rule of law, that's where tyranny can easily prevail. And the paradox of the internet, uh, 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 an instrument that was built on very libertarian ideals, is that cons to conserve its inclusiveness, to conserve its free nature, to conserve its, uh, its human rights aligned character will require a greater rule of law precisely to protect that. Um, and I think that's something that we're beginning to, to understand uh, better. But of course, that has to be, as you said, a bottom-up and multi-stakeholder um, approach. With that, I'd like to return to His Excellency um, Sultan uh, Alolama. Excellency, the first uh, idea in the roadmap on global digital cooperation is to create a strategic and empowered multi-stakeholder high-level body as part of the IGF. Uh, which can strengthen its responsiveness and relevance. What role do you see for this body to support global digital cooperation? Thank you, Fabrizio, and it's been very exciting hearing all of the inputs from the different panelists. Um, I do echo every single point that was raised and would like to add uh, one more important uh, factor that I think we need to factor in when thinking about um, the IGF and as well uh, Internet Access for All and putting a roadmap. Um, what we tend to forget um, is we tend to sometimes think very generically, uh, put a plan and expect that everyone understands you know, where we need to go and, and that's it. But um, as was proposed by His Excellency the Minister um, uh, that spoke right after me, um, certain countries are leapfrogging specific issues and are today achieving what took 20, 30, 40 years for other countries to do. And the adoption rates are quite high. So, in, so in the challenges and the, and the issues are not linear um, in a sense, they're very sporadic when it comes to uh, developing the infrastructure and putting the policies uh, in comparison uh, between these countries. I, I tend to think that first and foremost, what we need to do is not look at all countries on one map equally. Um, I think when it comes to technical capabilities, then there are, for example, very, um, very finite and very set variables that, that help us determine who's advanced versus who's still a laggard. But if you look at the citizens and the adoption uh, and the policies as well, I think everyone has a chance to, to thrive there and we need to have an open discussion rather than uh, set a very generic uh, proposal. Um, I also think that we need to be pushing a universal basic tech infrastructure that is truly global in nature. We hear the private sector when it comes to SpaceX and some of the other companies, um, Facebook and Google uh, amongst them, looking at providing internet for all using uh, certain means and certain technologies. But it's not just about um, internet for all. There are so many other technological requirements from an infrastructure perspective that need to be provided. And we do not need to wait for the private sector to take that mantle and monetize it. Sometimes it does require for governments and NGOs to come together and actually uh, work 
on putting a universal basic tech infrastructure that allows for everyone to become uh, truly tech savvy and be a part of this world and ensure that no one's left behind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And we, we admire the, the leadership you've shown and, and UAE um, has shown precisely for those ends. I'd like to go back to, to Minister Senge um, of uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, Excellencies, how would you like to see the IGF better bridge the gap between discussions and concrete solutions? I think it comes down to partnerships and I um, and often and a criticism that existed really um, of these um, consortiums and conferences and meetings and forums before was that it did not lead to the outcomes that we all spoke about and desired. But I think since the launch of since um, the, the, the launch of the since the launch of the of the of the activities this summer um, with you, Fabrizio, and the Secretary General um, on digital, uh, we've seen that at every engagement, it leads to more partnerships. And more specifically, actually, with UAE, and I remember maybe three, four, five months ago, um, that conversation led to a set of bilateral meetings between Sierra Leone and UAE and has led to ongoing collaborations now in, in actually building tangible experiences between our two countries. So these things are not just hypothetical with the government of Norway. I think I have a meeting with the Minister of International Development of Norway next week, again, which happened on, along the sidelines um, of these conversations that we're having. Um, and with UNICEF, um, there are incoming new activities that will be announced soon in the 4IR space, all linked to these digital public goods. So I think it really is that the right people, uh, I think somebody had mentioned having the right people in the, in the room, the right people having the conversation. So not just the right people mean people who are technical, people who can be policy makers, the, the policy makers, and who understand the problems that are going to be solved. Um, and that link between the problems, the understanding of the technology and the opportunity that exists will only be, will, can be the, 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 the leverage that we need and the opportunity that exists for us to take advantage of the UN network and its global partnership and global, the globalization really that digitization and technology and the internet enhances. So. I think it comes down to the right partnerships, strengthening the right partnerships and, and demo or die, really just demonstrate, go test something. We can hypothesize all we want. The right ideas are the right ideas. Good ideas are good ideas. Uh, we, 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 we can't over theorize good ideas. We have to go test them. And the way to, to, to get results is by testing them and we learn from them. We have the humility to test those, to test our tests, our pilots, and see what needs to be changed, what needs to be modified, what we can improve and go back and do them. And then be open and generous enough to share that with the rest of the world. I think there are lots of good ideas and good pilots that are never shared back to the world and are never shared on this, 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 this opportunity. So it's the right partnership humility, generosity to share, I think is what we need. I like that um, generosity to share partnerships that are, that are giving um, is, is critical. Um, on the, I'd like to, to now um, move and talk a bit about communications and financing. And uh, I'd like to come back to you, uh, Lisa. Um, can you tell me what additional sources of outreach and financing should be considered for, for the IGF? Oh, thank you for the question, uh, Fabricio. Uh, I actually think the beauty of, of, of this question, and, and I agree, this is a, a really important question, is that I think it's part of a, a, a virtual circle. Um, if we get the people and the groups that matters to join the IGF and in this room, we will actually have the discussions that are needed, the fruitful discussions that are important for all the stakeholders. And I think it's important we have the policymakers, the civil society, we need the companies, the technical community. We need them to take those messages and, and discussions home. We need them to be inspired 
and and to implement them because that's when you realize the value of coming to IGF. And I think uh, the the visibility and the support uh, of the IGF it it really rests on the participations uh, and the participants. And but another very important element for me is also that. IGF should not be something that just happens once a year. We need that discussion to continue between the IGFs. We don't want more than one meeting a year, but we need to, to have our members uh, um, involved also between the meetings. And there are other forums where you can bring those discussions. Um, uh, Edno and our members have been involved both in Eurodig and in, in CDIC, and, and we think those are extremely important for us to, to continue those uh, discussions. And it's if we build on an ongoing discussion at the international, at the regional, and also at the national level, that we attract all the relevant stakeholders. And this is how we can actually remain attractive and continue to get the support that is actually need for, uh, needed for uh, IGF to, to thrive. I think it's, it's important that discussion is, is not just a one-off, it's an ongoing discussion that needs to be both here in IGF, but also uh, percolated out into the, the member state uh, or the, the, the state, sorry. Thank you. So thank you, Lisa. And I think your, your two points about trying to create a virtue cycle where, where we get the funding required because people see usefulness in the exercise. Uh, and secondly, the, the point of the IGF not being a one-off annual event, but an ongoing process and an ongoing discussion, not necessarily with a multiplicity of meetings, but through enhanced networking and dialogue are, are very important. Uh, I'd like to come back to Joseph now and would like to ask you what additional methods for concrete policy recommendations you would like to see tested at the IGF. Thanks. Uh, uh, so I think it's important to recognize the value of a discursive forum and not discount it and, 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 and understand that uh, the value that IHF brings as a discursive forum is, is discursive forum is really, really important. And, and so while we're thinking about potential different ways to have you know concrete outcomes or concrete policy recommendations, I don't want to lose track of the fact that, that, that talking and talking in a multi-stakeholder environment that's well moderated, well set up, um, that has a good level of accessibility is, is, is something that there's just not a lot of other places like that, despite the fact that we haven't penetrated everyone's brain, as Olga has said. Um, but I do think it's pretty easy to pick a few genres of outcomes and try to create forums in IGF where folks that participate in those forums are on notice that this isn't purely discursive. So for example, you could imagine, you know, an effort where by entering this aspect of the IGF discussion, you are committing to take part in a pilot project to commit some funds to um, uh, fund some additional research that may be informed by the discussion that happens, you know, it's, it's, so I don't think that's hard. What I do think we'd have to do is come together and think about what are the outcomes that this multi-stakeholder environment particularly values or wants to see more of. Do you want to see um, novel forms of, of, of networks out there? This is the kind of stuff we do, so sorry to be a one-note um, thing. Um, do you want to, you know, what are those? And so I have some feelings for what those are, but I think that having a session that actually talks about different outcomes and how to set up the rules in different IGF forum to focus on those and let people sort of know that, like, for example, we're expecting you to make changes to your business operations by spending some time with us. Um, you know, you have to set that up pretty well for people to play, right? But um, I think that we can get to that kind of a thing. But that, Sorry thank to speak so fast. No, 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 Joseph, thank you. Uh, and I think I think your your emphasis on not um, disregarding the, the the value of of the of the IGF as a discursive forum, but I, I, it is very valuable and very important, and we should record. But I think we also have to beware not to establish a sort of dichotomy between either a discursive forum or one with outcomes. I mean, hopefully we can combine both, uh, and I don't think outcomes are necessarily. Um, uh, contrary to, to, to maintaining the very valuable discursive character of, of the IGF. 
Olga, if I could, if I could turn to you, yeah. um, in addition to the creation of the multi-stakeholder high-level body, how could the IGF boost its high-level engagement and then hopefully through that impact? Uh, very good question, and I think the IGF has been the, the, the source for so many, so many interesting activities like the schools of internet governance, regional IGF, national IGF, so I think it, it has a, a great potential. I still think there is a gap, as I said before, with universities, but I think it's still a gap with other regional and also global activities that do not address exactly what the what the IGF is doing. So the multi the, the mag and the high level uh, the the high level body could find ways to um, contribute with content. And I, I like what Liz said about doing activities in between the different IGFs. It's not only one one time a year activity, but it's a process along the year. So the MAC and, and this high level group could partner and be in touch with regional and national activities and then uh, in, send some documents, send some input, perhaps partner with some experts that can participate. Now that we have learned that, that the distance doesn't exist for participation, we organized the school virtual uh, last month and we had many, many experts from all over the world and 500 500 students. So we, we now know that we can count of experience and knowledge from all over the world and from all over the, uh, the experts. So let's profit on that and let's profit from what we have learned with this pandemic that participation is not limited. Now we have learned and let's do that with in, in exchanging the IGF experience into other uh, existing processes, schools, uh, regional IGF, national IGF, government activities, government meetings, technical meetings. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Olga. And it's good to have a reminder of just what the IGF has, has led to coming into being uh, through, through its activities. Uh, Miranda, a final question. Uh, what type of outcomes would you like to see from the IGF in the future? Oh, that's a big question. Um, we, I think what we would, what from my perspective would be extremely valuable is to take this discursive frame and absolutely run with the idea that the goal should be to make it easier for stakeholders with limited budgets, power, expertise to make their voices heard in this valuable discursive process. And that the IGF should be convened in various regions taking place outside of Europe. And that there should be an active process, a thoughtful process of considering the value of examples of multi-stakeholder initiatives, such as the Global Network Initiative which in our experience has developed into a valuable and impactful resource for many kinds of stakeholders. So not diminishing at all the discursive value of the forum and the process, but also thinking how do we design in this multi-stakeholder sharing of knowledge in an intentional way? Because of the Freedom House Freedom on the Net report in 2020 argued, the best way to stave off the rise of cyber sovereignty is to restore confidence in the legitimacy and the efficacy of the existing multi-stakeholder model. We'd look to see practical steps to, for people to rally, to see how to architect, how to develop the capacity and resources to bring together the various important conversations on digital cooperation so that there is more capacity for the IGF to become a central node for many of those conversations. And we appreciate the fact that some governments have shown a strong interest in strengthening the IGF and that the, central, the Secretary General's roadmap also points in that direction. Um, we'd look to see um, as a part of this kind of broader and more practical stakeholder linkage and participation, that there is intentional linking to uh, other parts of the UN or the OECD, which is developing important internet and other policy principles and to, and to multi-stakeholder fora like Rightscom. But I'd also like to just briefly hark back to Joseph's comment and give him plus one. 
Um, the question I'd like to, to ask everybody is what happens if we seek to also adapt the IGF toolset and experiment with becoming agile in some way to meet these challenges? If we can rally multi-stakeholder focus to define a problem to solve using the tech tool toolkit of understand, co-design, create, iterate, what can we do? What experiment could we run now and humbly to provide rapid value now for this unprecedented time of COVID and for this unprecedented moment of regulatory action. I'll stop there. Those are thoughts rather than comments, but I hope they're useful. Uh, Miranda, a lot of interesting thoughts about how we can use the technology to in, try and formalize an experiment better, and in particular to, to, to get more road grip with this multi-stakeholder approach. I think those are very valuable uh, ideas and I hope we can, I think we all hope we can move in that direction. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you that, that spoke for the, for, the outstand, for the brevity and outstanding inputs. I think it's been a rich discussion. Uh, this concludes this segment of our discussion. I'd like now to turn over to Rudolf Griedel, who is a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group and a co-champion of the high level panel recommendation on global cooperation architecture. Uh, Rudolf will moderate a dialogue now on these key uh, areas. Uh, Rudolf, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Fabrizio, and also from me. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody, distinguished uh, guest speakers and panelists. Um, I am also very honored to uh, be the moderator of this expert session. Um, we have already had a very good discussion on the diverse questions concerning the way forward in the architecture of uh, the internet governance. And I'm very pleased to continue this with um, renowned experts. Uh, but my first uh, question would go to uh, His Excellency Thomas Schneider, who is the ambassador and director of the International Affairs at the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. And uh, he has been around in the internet governance scene for quite some time. I would say from the very outset, at least uh, from the this is, um, forum. So uh, Thomas, for you, the question from your experience and all the networks that you have been in and are you, you are still in, uh, how can we manage this um, aim of an accelerated cooperation? Um, how, can the, how can these different stakeholder groups, organizations, and for uh, uh, come together, break the silos, and, and even better work together. Thank you, Rudolf. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. And it's good to see you all, at least, if not physically, at least virtually. So I hope everybody's fine and, and healthy. And uh, with regard to your question, uh, indeed, <clears throat> one of the key issues of breaking the silos is bridging the gap between the discussions and pragmatic solutions. So that um, when it comes to the future of digital cooperation and of the IGF as a process, this will work. And in this regard, we as Switzerland have a clear vision that the IGF needs to evolve into what many call an IGF plus to become this keynote for digital governance. <clears throat> the IGF has already over the years repeatedly demonstrated its value for identifying emerging topics and for sharing policy discussions. And its rich and experienced multi-stakeholder community has always offered a fertile ground for further evolution and development. In our eyes, the IGF is predestined to be the place in the future to shape policies for our digital world. And to use uh, an expression that was used in the high level panel, the IGF in our view can and should be the kitchen where many of the dishes can be prepared that are needed to address the challenges in our digital present. However, excellent discussions and brilliant ideas and insightful approaches to solutions developed at the IGF run the risk of fading away unheard and unheeded if they do not reach the halls of the decision-making institutions and fora. And this is why we do need, strong, to, need to build stronger bridges between the actors especially, again, between the discussions and insights of the experts, like here at the IGF, 
and the decision makers, including high level decision makers among all stakeholder groups. The UN SG's roadmap and the options paper prepared by the co-champions that are here, the UAE and, and Germany for Roundtable 5 A and B, and of course the office of Fabrizio, contain important ways and means to make this happen. So we really think that these things should be implemented. First, by boosting the relevance and impact of the IGF intercessional policy networks and their outputs, as already been mentioned. For instance, by covering politically relevant topics like the issue of digital self-determination or the intersection between digitization and climate change. And by connecting these policy networks with the decision-making levels through linking these network discussions with the high-level segment of the multi-stakeholder high-level body through relaying these policy networks and IGF outputs to all other fora directly through their engagement and at a high level through the multi-stakeholder high-level body. Second, by effectively and timely addressing urgent issues with an empowered IGF. Third, by increasing the ownership of the IGF way of doing things in decision-making levels through the high-level segment parliamentarian track that we've seen growing in Berlin and the rotating membership of the multi-stakeholder high-level board. And finally, by strengthening our valuable secretariat of the IGF and also its funding in order to allow it to more effectively liaise with other institutions and fora and creating the right synergies with the Future Tech uh, Envoy office. Funding is key there because with no funding, you are not present even in virtual meetings because of this takes time. And finally, by strengthening the links and synergies between the IGF and existing observatories, help desks, active in offering quality information and capacity building in the field of digital governance, like the Geneva Internet Platform and the various schools of internet governance that have been mentioned already. And then in addition, we can improve the inclusiveness of the IGF Plus by including voices and views of ordinary citizens, particularly from the Global South through citizens dialogues, which have been successfully tested this year. So with such evolutions and the ideas are there, we just need to implement them. We are convinced that the IGF will be in a position of playing the major role of a major multi-stakeholder node in the network of digital policy shaping and making fit to answer the challenges of our interdependent digital world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for these very concrete and, and actionable ideas. Um, there, there is uh, one forum where some of these ideas are already being tested, and that's the European Dialogue on Internet Governance. And I'm very happy and pleased to have Sandra Hoferichter uh, here now, who is the Secretary General of the uh, European Dialogue, which is uh, abbreviated as EuroDIG, and uh, also a very knowledgeable um, uh, internet governance expert. So, Sandra, um, the issue that also Thomas raised of, of actionable outcomes. Uh, what, what, what can we do concretely to have more outcomes that are relevant for people outside uh, the IGF community? What, what is your experience with uh, Eurodic on that? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening also from Leipzig. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Um, Rudolf, I would like to uh, redirect your question in a little bit different uh, direction. Um, what, and I would say, what can be done to make the outcomes of the IGF more relevant to decision makers? You know, as an organizer of a regional forum, I'm advocating that we have already quite a number of good outcomes, and I would rather like to see them to become more influential than thinking about what can we produce in addition. Let me quickly name what I consider to be an output of the multi-stakeholder discussions, and I will be brief because many things have been said already by the other distinguished speaker. So messages, reports, papers that steam from all the sessions, workshops, plenaries, but also from best practice for us, dynamic coalitions are the main outcome that are produced in all IGF initiatives. A lot of effort even was invested in transparent reporting methodologies including common phases by involving all stakeholders. We know these outcomes are not negotiated, but they are built on consensus, and that makes them strong and weak at the same time. 
depending from which perspective you look at them. They are strong because the substance has a broad support from multiple stakeholders, and they can be weak because it is sometimes the minimum a group could agree on. But sometimes even the group agrees to disagree. And I think this is a message too, because it points to the direction in which a discussion has to be continued. If we would call for more papers to be produced, I wonder what it would envision, envision other than resolutions or declarations. But then we are giving up on the unique selling point of the IGF and ignoring the mandate that the IGF has. A second output is the input that participants gain from the IGF. And I think that's totally underestimated. Just to give you a bright idea or an example, what could be achieved when a legislator understood the technical basis before adopting law or when they understood the implications of such a law might have in practice. On the other side, it helps when someone from the technical community understands the constraint of an elected legislator and the relation between code and law. This could be achieved at the IGF. The third output is the global societal debate. We need to have this societal debate on methodologies, values, risk challenges, opportunities in order to build a sustainable digital future. Without broad consensus, we risk to damage and fragment our network. A fourth outcome is the publication of transcripts, videos, rec records, messages, there is meanwhile a huge repository of knowledge and many PhD students and researchers are referring to these sources, analyze it for their research. And I think that's also highly underestimated. Fifth, involvement of young people. I think we pretty well in this regard, youth programs are always on the agenda of many IGFs and many youngsters that started in such a program became high level experts later on. The sixth is the tremendous growth of national and regional IGFs that can be considered as one of the most significant outcome of the IGF mandate. To give you a number, as of uh, 2019, there were more than 120 initiatives located in all five regions of the world. This proves that there is a desire for multi-stakeholder discussion in all parts of the world. This all happened with very little resources and often on a voluntary basis. We now have to place all these achievements on a more solid fundament in order to add more building blocks on the future. And the question is uh, with an IGF plus model, what can such building blocks entail? I understand that many of the things that I have just mentioned of the outcomes cannot be measured. And I'm also, as an organizer of a regional IGF, constantly thinking what can be done from our side to become more visible and more relevant. First and foremost, I think uh, we can improve on the communication on our outcomes. Just look at how it is reported on the World Economic Forum or on climate summits. We have to get there. It's possible. But in some respect, this involves also hard lobby work, something this community is not really familiar with. But it's normal in other industries too. We currently just don't have the resources to do so. And uh, secondly, make sure our messages, our reports are really understood. And I'm saying nothing new here, that capacity building is key. And Olga elaborated already a lot of why uh, these things are important and what is in place already. Third, we have to narrow the gap between the level of discussions and the decision-making level. It just started with the involvement of parliamentarians and we must win this group as a constant contributor to the IGF and we can help them to connect with each other to exchange on their experiences. Um, they just reiterated their willingness during the parliamentary round table on Tuesday and it's our task to guide them through our sometimes complicated participation processes. Sandra, Sandra, I don't want to Thank you, but we have to we have to look a little bit to the, to okay. the clock. I, I come to an end and I summarize what I consider the most urgent action items for the IGF and all national and regional initiatives, initiatives improve the communications and make sure our outcomes are really understood. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra, for, for some great insights. And um, I, I'm now turning to, to Boca Barr, who, who is a broadband commissioner and an advocacy specialist uh, focused on the promotion of sustainable digital development, ICT infrastructure expansion, and investment through collaboration and multi-stakeholder partnerships in the Middle East and the Africa region. He's also the CEO and a board member of Samena Telecommunications Council, and he has several high-ranking tasks within the ITU. And for 29 years, he's been a professional uh, with experience in the telecoms industry. So, Bokar, with all your experience and all your knowledge and everything we have heard today, um, do you have any ideas that you could share with us about the great issue of inclusion that is so so vital and so crucial for the development of internet and internet governance. It would be great to hear your insights from all your experience. Thank you very much, uh, Rudolf, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen from Dubai. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today in this important session, which aim to enhance stakeholder inclusion, as mentioned by uh, Rudolf, and enable broader participation on this IGF platform. As, as has been identified in the roadmap for digital cooperation, the world is at a critical inflection point concerning technology governance with multiple issues and challenge abound. These need to be addressed jointly with, and we have heard that earlier from my colleague, everyone heard equally to ensure we can develop cooperative ways of overcoming such issues and challenges so that we remain aligned on fulfilling the globally agreed sustainable development goals and together ultimately reap the positives of the digital revolution. Now, the option papers spells out very clearly where we need to improve our efforts to include the developing nations Inclusivity has been identified as one of the biggest challenges and the most important pillars for supporting improved cooperation, especially in the digital space. Colleagues, we all require sharing information and experience on, and I would like to repeat again, an equal footing to help ourselves and those with policymaking powers to pursue actions based on informed decisions. This can truly enable thoughtful discussions and dissemination of best practices for the express purpose of enabling more countries, and this is important, to realize the economic and societal benefits of digital transformation that we are talking about globally. In this regard, the IGF informs and inspires those with policy making power in both public and private sector. Given the tremendous potential that the platform IGF carries and drawing inspiration from it, there are multiple ways we can further inclusion in global digital cooperation, and especially from so far under, let's say, represented stakeholders group. This can start with incentivizing a greater participation within the forum for all stakeholders and countries and create a sense of belonging, and someone before me mentioned that, for the relevant decision makers from the developing nations. Uh, as an example, the, the preparation for the IGF agenda and priorities must be focused enough to allow for fruitful dialogue and yet be general enough so to remain relevant to both developed and developing nations. One such subject is, for example, the focus on sustainable digital economy, which concerns developing and developed nations alike. If we can elevate, and I will be short, uh, Rudolf, uh, the concern of national ICT players, just as an example, uh, national incumbent operators to be uh, to the highest level of the IGF agenda for, uh, when we are forming it, this will immediately enhance the focus and relevance of the IGF to those stakeholders and hence to the geography they are representing in those countries. And generally our approach and policy governance 
and regulation has to be driven by objective. And it was listed by Fabrizio at the beginning of the talk. So the ultimate objective is leave no one behind. And in conclusion, the stakeholders in developing nations are very keen on pursuing collaboration in order to make progress on both national ICT visions as well as global commitments. Now, given that the internet is undergoing fundamental changes, it is inevitable that the world will learn to cooperate better and all nations will have to strive toward achieving and facilitating inclusiveness. And the IGF has a well-defined, much needed role to play in helping all nations embrace these changes that we are talking about. Thank you very much, Rudolf. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mokar. And um, our, our next uh, expert uh, is actually one of um, uh, one out of three of my bosses or former bosses that are now on this uh, expert call is Miss um, Lynn Sandemore. She is um, has been for a long, very many years, the CEO of the Internet Society, and then she was the chair of the MAG. And in this capacity, she was my boss. I was a humble, ordinary MAG member. The, uh, German um, IGF in Berlin 2019. Uh, and we had already many uh, discussions, Lynn, about the question of financing uh, of, the, of the IGF and the communication. So with all your experience, what, what are your insights and your ideas about this uh, very crucial and critical topic, which has already been raised several times this evening? Thank you, Rudolf. And one of the pluses of being part of a multi-stakeholder process is there really are no bosses. <laughs> we're, we're all in it together as, as equals. Um, I mean, I, I will just come quickly to the point where I support so many of the comments that are made, in particular um, Thomas and Sandra and Bokar's comments here with respect to the things we could do to improve um, the IGF's attractiveness, if you will. Um, the IGF community has been working on all these problems and issues now for a very long time, since its very first days, in fact. Um, so many elements are pre-positioned. We have a great idea what needs to be done, good ideas of how they could be done, who we would reach out to. Partnerships are certainly central to so much of what we do. The one thing we lack still consistently is finances to support the resources to do this. We have lots of outputs and they could be strengthened, they could be improved, primarily I think in how they're communicated and how they're kind of aggregated and, and then ultimately shared. But again, we lack the resources to do that. And most of you will have heard me say this before, you know, we get, the IGF gets a tremendous amount of support from a very small number of governments and an even smaller number of private sector companies. Um, and, you know, I, I think to some extent, there's not a great enough appreciation of the benefit of these deliberative dialogues. The problems we're all grappling with are complex, they're nuanced, they differ by societal and cultural and geographic, they differ um, by any individual's understanding of those particular topics and their own contextual environment. So it takes time to really understand and pull apart uh, those key, key components. But I think that's not recognized well enough. I, I, maybe it's coming more to that point. If I look at some of the work of Mission Publique and even some of the Stanford deliberative processes, a lot of what the IGF has done and is trying to do. But we, need, we really need to break the back of the financing problem. And I think there are some elements to do that. The IGF MAG had a working group on financing. We're restricted somewhat by our UN affiliation and some of their own um, financing requirements. But I think there are ways to get um, through those. Transparency helps. Um, putting the MAG um, in charge for defining any terms of refer reference of any pilot or any project that might be funded from external um, money or sources. Making it a central part of the, the uh, IGF's policy activities at any point in time. All those things would help bring more attention, more funding, more outcomes. And I do believe there are ways to do that. 
that would not endanger um, any kind of UN, UN rules or protocols, um, would ensure that they weren't um, captured by any specific special interests. Again, transparency, putting the MAG in a very significant responsibility position would help that. The World Economic Forum has some models that I think would need to be adapted for the IGF, but are also good um, learning experiences for how we could bring in more support, more resources, and more and more funding. Um, I know we're a little short on time, so so I'll, I will stop there. But the number one problem we all need to fix is resources and financing, and that starts with all of us doing everything we can to advocate for the IGF, to pull in participation to pull in um, um, acknowledgement of the outputs, to put them into all of our other work streams as well, so that there continues to be an even greater uh, awareness. And here, I think the UN could play a very significant role and honestly have not always been as present as I think we might have expected them to be given Kofi Annan's um, leadership and vision so many years ago. Um, so I will stop there um, and at least hope that was concrete enough and to some degree helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. It was very concrete and, of course, very helpful. And um, so now it would be interesting to hear a view from the uh, private sector, Mr. Radoslav Kejia, who is um, the vice president of Huawei uh, for CEE and the Nordic countries. And um, as, a, as a private sector representative, I would like to ask you, uh, Radoslav, what is your what is your view on this um, idea to have a high level engagement, to have more high level um, participation and perhaps also outreach within the IGF system? Um, do you have any uh, views on that? What, what would be your assessment of these ideas? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm very impressed by my uh, predecessors uh, and uh, points of view. I think it is uh, um, it is a very good question, and uh, I think we should uh, start with several points. Uh, I have put them down to some extent to make it to make my uh, thinking stream more systematic. So first of all, the pandemic has accelerated uh, the digital an intelligent transformation and reminded us that we are in urgent need of innovation and cooperation to ensure the effect the technology has on society and individuals is positive, balanced and inclusive. We would like to share our practices as well as commitment to innovation, equal opportunities, diversity and inclusion globally with a focus on collaborating with them to create better society for every person family and organization. The digital technologies have unleashed a new age of computing, communications and information mobility. Maybe you've seen, but my predecessors don't talk about laptops or computers. They talk about mobile phones. This is the reality. And with the pandemic uh, uh, situation, this mobile communication plays uh, a much more important role uh, in our daily life work and other activities. Um, the digitalization has become a global trend that could bring profound changes to life and economies. And therefore, uh, there need to be a global multi-stakeholder efforts and uh, global inclusive standards that apply for all. The time when the US had uh, so global technological leadership and dominance and has, has been the greatest driver and beneficiary of technology, innovation, and also a vibrant uh, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial spirit have passed. Inclusive cooperation in the digital sector across all the regions and balanced competition that bring more opportunities have become significant more than ever. As we are living in all the more connected world with blurred boundaries, attempts to undermine global cooperation in the digital sector or attempts to exclude certain stakeholders from the markets should be prevented in order for all of us not to bear the costs of this exclusion. 
In addition, <clears throat> we continue to work with industry partners to build a more inclusive and sustainable industry ecosystem with a focus on driving progress towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. As we create a digital and intelligent world together, we are bringing its benefits to more individuals, homes and organizations. And today we need to accelerate this global digital cooperation, seizing on the opportunities that are presented by technology while mitigating the risks so that the progress towards achieving the goals by 2030 can be made collectively. Huawei stands ready to help the countries, its societies and our partners around the globe to harness the power of technology and innovation. And we welcome the cooperation with all the stakeholders and are committed to fight all types of exclusion around the globe. My predecessors were talking about the differences between the developed market and developing markets. And I think uh, this is very important to keep in mind that there are different ways of looking at the uh, importance of the digitalization in different parts of the world. But it means that we have to come together and, and uh, harness them, having looking at them from a different point of view. And I think this is one of the, of the opportunities <clears throat> for IGF to play this uh, role of having a um, uh, global view and including everyone in its organization to address the challenges that are coming from a different angles and different dimensions. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to also mention is that, uh, you know, hearing my uh, former uh, speakers, that the existing digital cooperation architecture has become highly complex and diffused, but not necessarily effective. And global discussions and processes are often not inclusive enough. This situation is um, exaggerated by the lack of common standards and rules for the global digital architecture, which makes it especially hard for developing countries, small and medium sized enterprises, marginalized groups and other stakeholders with hard hit economies by the pandemic, limited budgets uh, and expertise to make their voice heard. And also in those difficult times, you see, we are all uh, embracing the fact that we can communicate between each other uh, without being um, uh, very closely to each other. And it became part of our life, whether this is in the uh, forums like IGF, whether it's in our work, whether it's in learning, whether it's in medicine, this kind of uh, communication becomes a new normal. And we have to have standards, how to make it simple for the organizations to adapt to the technological baseline that will allow everyone to use this technology in a unified manner. And my predecessors were talking about the governance and governance doesn't mean limitation. Doesn't government, government, uh, governance means uh, setting up the standards and basic rules that everyone can follow. For example, certification of certain technologies or um, set of uh, recommendations, how to prepare the technologies in certain areas, uh, regardless if it's economical area, educational area, geographical area, to be used uh, on the know. same way. I was about to finish actually. Thank you okay. for, for having me. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm very sorry and I also want to want to apologize uh, to the next speakers that I have to um, exhort them now to be concise and short. Um, Andreas, you are my current next chair, not boss, I heard. Um, and you are the birthday child of the day. So happy birthday from me and everybody. Um, you are somebody who has been working on internet governance issues for, for a very long time. and. Um, you are one of the uh, most outstanding experts in uh, Africa and Southern Africa and also member of the Internet Hall of Fame. So my question to you would be, um, coming from the multi-stakeholder community and uh, being in, in this community, what do you think about this idea of uh, high-level engagement of new high-level ideas uh, that we would perhaps need in the, in the Internet Governance uh, Forum Plus? Uh, that has, has been on the table for uh, some uh, months now. Thank you, Henriette. 
Thanks very much, um, uh, Rudolf. Um, I I want to talk, you know, just briefly before I I, I talk specifically about that. Um, um, the particular multi-stakeholder high-level body, just a little bit about the challenges of digital cooperation, um, because I think it's not easy, and I think we need to take that into account. Firstly, the scope of cooperation. Um, the internet and digital technologies don't exist in a parallel universe. So the challenges that we need to address are more than digital challenges. They involve working with more than just people in the digital sphere. Um, and, and, and so that makes it complex, that the scope of cooperation is quite vast. Secondly, the quality of cooperation. I think we know already from, from 20 years um, of working on this, on, in this, you know, through the WISIS process, trying to find solutions, that meaningful cooperation and partnership is not easy. We heard this from pre previous speakers as well. And multi-stakeholder engagement takes up more than just putting people from different backgrounds around the same table. It needs revealing um, differences, dealing with interest, working through these interests to build lasting partnerships. And then thirdly, inclusivity. And I think we just heard the previous speaker talk about this as well. And we talk a lot about cooperation and uh, being inclusive, but I think we use it quite loosely. Um, how do we develop the kind of targeted inclusivity? If you're dealing with hate speech, how do you make sure that the people that are impacted by hate speech, the people that perpetrate hate speech, that facilitate it are together? So this is complex. And then fourthly, I think sustaining cooperation. It takes time. It takes institutional capacity. And we've heard that from previous speakers as well. So to talk specifically about the multi-stakeholder high-level body, I think the IGF needs to evolve. I absolutely do. And I think connecting more effectively with leaders is part of what we need to do. And I think this body can help to achieve that. Um, but I think we also need to keep in mind that the IGF needs to connect effectively with two other groups as well that I think that we're not connecting with effectively enough. And that's people, communities, end users, people that are impacted by the issues we talk about, but that are not yet in the process itself, that don't come to the IGF, that are not part of NRIs. And then a second group, I think implementers, the small businesses, the, the, the people that build the network, that, that run the infrastructure on the ground, um, the, the local government officials, the technocrats, we need them in the IGF as well. And I think when we invest in this multi-stakeholder high-level body, we need to invest in it in a way that strengthens the credibility, the legitim legitimacy of the IGF, but not in a way that, that affects that strength of the IGF, the, the primary strength of the IGF, which is its bottom-up nature. We need to continue to invest in that at the very same time as we invest in, in better interinstitutional um, leadership relationships. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's, that's a very important point. And um, I want to direct it directly to the next speaker, um, who is Dr. Daniela Brandstrup, um, the director, my actual director in the Ministry for Economic Affairs in Germany. And uh, she was the host co uh, country co-chair of the MAG last year. And she's responsible for telecommunications policy for the G7 process and the G20 process and the multi-stakeholder processes, amongst others. So, Daniela, uh, well, we heard from Andriette and others that we need to focus on the multi-stakeholder aspect and the bottom-up aspect of the, of the IGF. Um, on the other hand, we want um, outcomes that are actionable and outcomes that are, that are um, relevant for the outside world. What is your view on this, um, of, on this challenge? Thank you so much, Rudy, for the question. And thank you, USG Hochschild. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, really delighted that at least we can meet each other virtually and that I can see you on screen today. Um, yes, coming to the question. Um, well, I would like to echo Fabrizio Hochschild indeed, because he mentioned earlier that we need on the one hand policy recommendation, and on the other hand, that doesn't mean that we um, do not need discussions. On the contrary, a good policy recommendation, uh, recommendations are built 
on discussions and I think the ITF plus should stay a discussion oh. body. Nevertheless, we should like, for example, Sandra said earlier, focus on recommendations or outcomes that uh, really help in changing the world. So in my view, we have already made considerable progress during the last years. Um, I remind you of the Geneva messages, the Paris call, the Berlin messages. You should continue on this path and try to make the messages even more action oriented and as concrete as possible. Um, I think that um, there is significant demand for stronger common orientation on digital pol uh, cooperation. And there have been proposals for stronger leadership which enjoy wide support and deserve particular attention. And I think this is especially the higher level group as a part of the IGF. Similar to an executive committee and in addition to the MAG, which could continue to focus on organizational tasks. The high level group would have a limited number of members to ensure operability and effectiveness, feature multi-stakeholder representation, and could provide input on IGF outcomes and create links to other fora. This suggestion would correspond to the strategic and empowered multi-stakeholder high level body mentioned in the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. While the group would not be a decision-making body, they would support bringing outcomes to decision makers. In my view, the high-level body needs to be interlinked with the MAC, of course, the MAC chair needs to be a born member of the high-level body. And the high-level body should be a transmission gear between the discussions at the IGF and the decision-making bodies. Last year, we had invited parliamentarians uh, to Berlin um, to make sure that the outcomes of the IGF are transmitted then to the political process. And I think that was very successful. And, and I heard that yesterday, the parliamentarian session at the IGF 2020 was very successful as well. And I think we should follow on that path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela. And last but not least, from the civil society, we have uh, Bruna Martins dos Santos. She's coordinator of the Internet Caucus um, and she's based in Brasilia. Uh, perhaps building on what Daniela just said about the outcomes, uh, Bruna, what are your, uh, what is your view? What are your insights? Could you share them with us, please? Thank you very much, Rudolf. It is an honor and a pleasure to be able to participate in this session today with so many esteemed colleagues. On behalf of the um, Internet Governance Caucus and um, organizations such as Access Now, World Wide Web Foundation and APC, we very much welcome um, this opportunity to address um, this timely IGF session on furthering global digital cooperation. Um, we already mentioned organizations have actively taken part in the digital cooperation process from its very inception and are committed to supporting the implementation of the roadmaps vision in which all stakeholders play a role in advancing a safer, more equitable world, one which, one which will lead to a brighter and more prosperous future for all. Um, in terms of outcomes and suggestions, we at first we commend the discussions on improving and strengthening the IGF, um, and both in the context of Roundtable 5A and B, the options paper, the MAG working group on strengthening and strategy. And, but when it comes to enhancing um, the IGF's mission, we agree that it's key for this space to attempt in facilitating an even greater range of outcomes and promote a broader range of discussions with um, all approaches. Um, additionally, we commend and welcome the IGF 2020 call for voluntary commitments. But jumping on um, to our recommendation, I think I would highlight three. Um, first of all, the need for stronger links between the IGF Secretariat and the Office of the UN SG and the TAC Envoy in the IGF as well in order to ensure higher visibility for this forum and better coordination with various other UN processes and projects. We likewise agree that both the appointment and eventual office and work of the TAC Envoy should also be grounded in principles of multi-stakeholder dialogue and transparency. Um, any possible discussions on reforming the IGF should take into consideration existing structures um, through improved documentation process, better integration of the intersessional streams such as BPFs, dynamic coalitions, as well as the national 
and regional um, IGFs in order to foster the development of more um, concrete outcomes and also um, more inclusivity in the parliamentarian track that has already been mentioned here. Um, we would also like to see a, an improved communication of the final messages to national parliaments and also the community as a whole. Um, last but not least, um, we would like to point out that this process should not create or should avoid creating duplications with the existing MAG or the processes that are already underway. Um, and we should um, retain this primary role of the MAG as a representative multi-stakeholder body. Um, and, and just to finalize my, inter finalize my intervention, I would say that the IGF should remain inclusive, open, gender responsive, and keep the multi-stakeholder nature of which has been its hallmark over the past 15 years. Thank you very much for the space. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we are already um, five minutes over uh, time. So um, that leaves me with nothing else but giving back to you, Fabrizio, and um, thanking you all for your valuable um, contributions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudolf. And I, I was listening to that discussion with, with great uh, interest and many, many important points uh, shared there. Um, I, I, I'll be very brief, but I, but I have to mention something within the time constraints, and I hope the person concerned won't get upset with me. But if I'm not mistaken, today, in fact, is an important day, not just because of this discussion, but even more so because I think it's Henrietta's birthday. So I think we're all fans here of Henrietta, and I'm not sure if we would, uh, uh, we might actually scare away if we tried to sing happy birthday together. But I know we all join in wishing her the best and, and, a, and a wonderful year um, ahead. Um, as we conclude, I would like to uh, invite each of the, the high level speakers we had at the beginning to make a quick 50 second commitment on how they will contribute to global digital cooperation, including a stronger IGF or IGF plus. So I think, uh, sadly, His Excellency Minister Sultan Olalama had to leave us, but I'd like to go to uh, His Excellency Minister Senge. Uh, over to you, sir. I think for me and my, because I sit in the, as Minister of Basic Engineering and Secondary Education and Chief Innovation Officer, my commitment is clear, is to support what um, the UN is doing in with these digital assets and particularly with the digital public goods. I think I remain committed as one of the um, alliance, the digital public goods alliance founding um, institutions and our government of Sierra Leone is focused on ensuring that we can use data, we can use technology that we can share, that we can engage with um, to transform national development. Um, and these assets have to generally be open and they have to be used for driving impact in our countries. And in Sierra Leone, for us, it is focus on human capital development, which is education, security, and health. Um, and that's what we need to do and are committed to. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Minister. If I could now go to Lise. Well, thank you. And uh, I think this dialogue showed that it's extremely important to discuss the future of the global digital cooperation. Uh, the, the two panels showed a high level of engagement and, and there were many commonalities, uh, including uh, we talked about inclusion, we talked about dialogue and also defining the differences uh, in, the, in the different stakeholders, which I think it's, it's important, but the underlying uh, point from my side is there is a strong commitment actually to the internet and to, to the multi-stakeholder model. We as Edno support it. We think it's important. All is involved, and it's it's a, a vital dialogue. And we actually think that this year exactly showed the need for a resilient internet, and it took a greater importance than than ever. So we will continue to to come together as a, a part of the global community to ensure a robust, open, secure, resilient, and accessible internet for everyone. We're here to continue the dialogue, not only with IGF, but also with Eurodic, with CDIC on, on uh, the national levels too. So we're a strong supporter. We think that dialogue must continue. Thank you. 
Thank you, and thank you for your contribution to making that dialogue continue. Joseph, over to you. Yeah, so at the Internet Society, we can commit to working through our community. We have uh, chapters in over 120 countries, including recently Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, um, and through our foundation, I can't speak for them, but to, to make sure we fund things that make sure that we have a stronger and a bigger internet, one that's uh, more inclusive. Um, and uh, fundamentally through our projects, which include, um, I won't bore you about them, uh, but please check us out on internetsociety.org, including things like um, a whole project around end-to-end -end encryption and the uh, Global Encryption Coalition, and where those issues overlap, um, we're happy to bring resources and capacity and connections to experts and things like that to, to improve that work and make sure that everyone has the, the kinds of information they need to make the decisions and the capacity they need to actually go out and do things like connect the, the rest of the, the, the world that is unconnected. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Uh, and we hugely uh, uh, appreciate um, the, the activism of your organization. Uh, Olga, if I could go to you. Thank you, Fabrizio. I think we're, we're facing challenging times. Economies will suffer. Technology will become very, very important, especially for developing economies, especially for the global south. Count on our huge network of thousands of um, fellows and experts from all stakeholders to continue this dialogue and enhance what the IGF is today and will be in the future. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Olga. Miranda, the last word. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. As you know, safeguarding an open, free, and unfragmented internet is more important than ever. The responsibility lies with all of us. And we at Facebook, and I and my team, are committed to preserving an open and secure internet that allows for information to flow freely and that enables an environment for sustainable innovation, economic development, and freedom of expression and association that creates a more connected and cooperative world. We're doing that every hour of every day. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, inspiring words. And now, if I could go back to where we started, uh, my dear friend um, Hannah Al Hashimi for the final for the final word. And wonderful to see you all. I'll say goodbye here, but please stay safe. And I look forward to to working together to realize the vision that so many have articulated, and where I think there's a strong convergence of views. Hannah, back to you. Thank you so very much, Your Excellency. Thank you all and thank you to, to all speakers for a really insightful and rich discussion. Um, given that we've uh, already gone over time, we thank you so very much for your patience and for making the time. Uh, I know for some it's three or four in the morning uh, in the East and in other cases, the middle of the day. Um, I think this has been an important, uh, an important step in moving forward uh, in this, uh, this, this discussion that has started in some ways all the way back in Geneva and Tunis um, and in other ways uh, in, in the realm of digital cooperation back in 2016, 2017, and we're very privileged um, to have been able to work and under your leadership, um, under Secretary General, and, uh, and under the leadership of the Secretary General on digital cooperation. So all that is left really building on what the panelists have said is to encourage all to join the Secretary General's call to connect um, respect and protect in the digital age um, and to note that this uh, is not just an event but really a stepping stone towards the next steps on digital cooperation um, on a digital future that we can all be proud of uh, for both present and future generations um, if i may allow me to use the opportunity to thank uh, all of the co-organizers um, together with uh, my co-facilitators titi and adama as mag members for the session um, i would really like to thank uh, rudolf as well um, for his his moderation, um, in addition, of course, uh, to yourself, Fabrizio. Um, and I would like 
to thank all of the participants for the active engagement. Um, I would also like to give you uh, a little bit of homework, uh, which is, of course, uh, to continue your work in supporting the, the IGF uh, Plus and in supporting global digital cooperation in all of your respective domains. Um, this is not something that any one uh, stakeholder group or any one um, country or person can do by themselves. And so we very much rely on all of you um, to be a part of this mission going forward. So thank you so very much um, and see you on the internet. Take care. Thank you so very much also to the technical team. I'm sorry I was uh, remiss in thanking you first. Very much appreciated. I think we can stop the recording at this point. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andres. Thank you. Thank you. To all of our interpreters as well, very much appreciated. I was listening in on some of the languages in between and, and really it, it cannot be an easy job. So thank you for that. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Andrea. I hope you enjoyed it. This is a birthday, I birthday thought, main session. I didn't well, that's it's it's lovely to get so many wishes. I wish I had more time to answer questions, but um, thanks a lot for a very well organized um, session. I hope you're happy. It's a team effort. It's a team effort. Um, and yeah, hopefully, we keep the momentum is. going. Titi still on the call? I believe so. I know she's diligently logged off, but, but I shall pass on the messages for sure. So thanks very much. Of course. Bye, everyone. Bye.